Welcome back to Understanding Quantum Information and Computation. My name is John Watrous, and I'm the Technical Director for IBM Quantum Education. This is the sixth lesson of the series, and it's the second lesson in the second unit of the series, which is on quantum algorithms. In the previous lesson, we discussed the query model of computation, and we saw that in that model, quantum algorithms can provide a striking advantage over classical algorithms including an exponential advantage in the case of Simon's problem. Unfortunately, the query model doesn't really have any direct or immediate practical relevance. The notion of a black box is a very useful abstraction, as it turns out, but we have some work to do if we're going to apply the insights that we've gained from the query model to a more standard computational setting, where inputs are given as strings of bits rather than as oracles or black boxes. The main purpose of this lesson is to establish a foundation from which we can do that. Here's an overview of the lesson. For much of the lesson, we're going to be focusing on computational cost, or in other words, how difficult different computational tasks are and how we can measure that difficulty. Roughly speaking, this translates to how long we have to wait for computations to finish, and ultimately, which computational problems we can solve and which ones are beyond our reach. We're going to start with a couple of examples, integer factorization and computing greatest common divisors, or GCDs for short. These are very good examples for illustrating the underlying principles, and they also both happen to be highly relevant to Shor's algorithm, which we'll discuss in the next lesson. So we'll effectively get double the mileage out of these examples. Then we'll discuss the notion of computational cost more generally and how we can measure it. There are many different ways that this can be done, but we'll focus pretty narrowly on how we can do this with circuit models of computation, specifically Boolean circuits and quantum circuits. The focus here will be on algorithms, as opposed to computer hardware, for instance, and we'll be more concerned with how the costs of running an algorithm scale as the specific problem instances it's run on grow in size, rather than on how many seconds, minutes, or hours some particular computation requires. The idea that motivates this point of view is that algorithms have fundamental importance. To this day, we're still running algorithms that were developed a very, very long time ago. And very naturally, they will be deployed against larger and larger problem instances using faster and more reliable hardware as technology develops. And the way that they scale tells us a great deal about how useful they are and how useful they'll continue to be. In the last section of the lesson, we'll turn to a critically important task, which is running classical computations on quantum computers. The reason this is important is not because we hope to replace classical computers with quantum computers, which seems extremely unlikely to happen anytime soon, if it ever happens, but rather because it opens up many interesting possibilities for quantum algorithms. Specifically, once we know how to run classical computations on quantum computers, they become available to quantum algorithms as subroutines, so we can effectively leverage everything we know about classical algorithms in the pursuit of quantum computational advantages. The classical computers that we have today are truly marvels of technology. They're incredibly fast, but they're not so fast that no computational problem is beyond their reach. Some computational problems are so inherently difficult that although we do have algorithms to solve them, no computer on the planet Earth today is fast enough to run these algorithms to completion on even moderately sized inputs within the lifetime of a human, or even within the lifetime of the Earth itself. To explain further, let's take a look at the integer factorization problem. The problem statement is very simple. The input to the problem is an integer n that's at least 2, and the output is the prime factorization of n. And what that means is a list of the prime number factors of n together with the powers that these prime numbers must be raised in order to get n by multiplying them all together. Of course, we can always multiply the prime factors together in any order, but aside from their ordering, prime factorizations are always unique for every choice of n. That fact is called the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, and if you're interested in learning more about it, it's something that you can find at the very beginning of many books on number theory. As a very simple example, here's the prime factorization of the number 12. 
It's 2 to the power 2 times 3 to the power 1. Not surprisingly, a computer can tell you this in the blink of an eye by simply searching iteratively for prime factors. Here's another example. I won't try to read this number. It's about 3.4 quator decillion, and I have to admit that I find it strange that there's even such a name. But anyway, it has 46 decimal digits, and here you can see its prime factorization. A computer can also tell you this. I factored this number using the factorint method that's included in the Symbolic Mathematics Library for Python, and it took a few seconds, which is not a particularly long time, but there was a noticeable delay. And certainly, the factorint method doesn't find this prime factorization by naively searching for prime factors. It actually uses a hybrid of different algorithms, including one called the Pollard Row algorithm, which is an algorithm for factoring that's more sophisticated than naively searching iteratively for prime factors. And although that might seem like a pretty large number, as an input to a computational problem, it isn't really all that large at all. It's only 46 characters. Here's one more example. It's a number with 309 decimal digits. If we write it in binary notation, it has 1024 bits, and that's why it's called RSA 1024. The prime factorization of this number is not currently known. This number comes from the RSA factoring challenge, which was run by RSA laboratories from 1991 to 2007. They offered cash prizes for the prime factorizations of various numbers of increasing size, including this one, which was worth $100,000 US, but that prize was never collected. The security of the RSA public key crypto system is based on the difficulty of integer factorization. If you can factor, you can break the system. And so, the purpose of the challenge was basically to track the state of the art in factoring. The bottom line is that factoring this number is beyond our current abilities. As far as we know, the problem itself is too complex for classical computers to solve in practice. The largest RSA challenge number to have been factored so far, by the way, has 250 decimal digits. It might be a little bit hard to read this on the screen, but here's the prime factorization of RSA 250. It was done in 2020 using an algorithm known as the number field sieve, and it was a collective effort involving tens of thousands of computers around the world. Now let's consider a different computational problem, which is the problem of computing the greatest common divisor, or GCD for short, of two non-negative integers. Here's a statement of the problem. The input consists of two numbers this time, n and m, and we're going to assume that they aren't both equal to zero. The goal is to compute the GCD of these two numbers, which is the largest integer d that evenly divides both n and m. And if you think about the prime factorizations of n and m, what you'll find is that the GCD is the product of all of the prime numbers that divide both n and m raised to the minimum of the powers that appear in the two prime factorizations. So, it's related to the problem of integer factorization. But it turns out to be much, much easier for computers to solve. We can compute GCDs for numbers with many thousands of digits in the blink of an eye. It's kind of pointless for me to try to show you examples on the screen because we could fill the entire screen with digits and we'd still be describing easily solved instances of this problem. But if you're interested, follow the link in the video description to the textbook page for this lesson and you'll find code cells for the sorts of computations that I'm talking about, including ones that compute GCDs of large numbers, and you can try them out for yourself. The question is, why is this possible to compute GCDs so easily? And the answer to that question is that we have efficient algorithms to compute GCDs. Among them is Euclid's algorithm, which was discovered over 2,000 years ago. But there are also other efficient GCD algorithms. And of course, we're talking about classical algorithms here. So that leads to another question. Could there be an efficient classical algorithm for integer factorization that would allow us to factor numbers like RSA 1024 in the blink of an eye? And the answer is yes, absolutely. There could be an efficient classical algorithm for factoring. And currently, we don't know any way to rule out that possibility. All that we can say is that we haven't found one yet. 
For all the classical factoring algorithms we know, we're still essentially searching for factors. And that puts numbers like RSA 1024 out of our reach. Efficient GCD algorithms, on the other hand, just don't work that way. They don't search for a greatest common divisor, they effectively just build it with a mechanical procedure that's roughly comparable in cost to multiplying the same two numbers together. And I'll say a little bit more about this later in the lesson. Of course, this is all building up to Shor's algorithm, which we'll see in the next lesson, which is an efficient quantum algorithm for computing prime factorizations. But we still have some ground to cover before we get there. Next, we're going to talk about a mathematical framework through which we can measure the computational costs of different algorithms, including ones we've already talked about. To be clear, we're going to be focusing very narrowly on circuits, which is just a small piece of a much broader subject. Let's start with a very high level view of an ordinary computation from the previous lesson, meaning in particular that we're not thinking about query problems. We're thinking about problems where the input is given explicitly as a binary string. Like I said in the previous lesson, we could of course allow other symbols if we chose to, but let's just keep things simple and stick with binary strings for both the input and the output. The computation itself could be modeled or described in a variety of ways, such as with the Turing machine model of computation, Boolean circuits, quantum circuits, or programs written in a language like Python or any other language of your choice. Like I said a moment ago, we're going to be focusing on circuits, Boolean and quantum. First, let's spend a little bit more time talking about the input and the output, which we're assuming are binary strings. Using binary strings, we can encode many different sorts of mathematical objects, such as numbers, vectors, matrices, graphs, descriptions of molecules, for instance, as well as lists of all of these objects and other ones as well. As a very simple example, if we want to encode non-negative integers as binary strings, we can use binary notation. Here in this table, you'll see the first 13 non-negative integers along with their binary representations, or encodings. Here in the third column, you can see the length of each of these encodings, which is just the total number of bits you need for the encoding. And here's a simple formula that tells you exactly how many bits are needed in general for any non-negative integer n. Notice, in particular, that the length of the encoding is generally much smaller than the number itself. It's logarithmic in the number. RSA 1024, for instance, has an encoding with length 1024, but the number itself is, of course, much larger than that. This encoding scheme works for non-negative integers, but if we want to handle arbitrary integers, including negative ones, we can simply tack on a sign bit. We can also allow any number of leading zeros in these encodings if we want the encodings to fill out a block of bits or a register of a fixed size, as long as it's big enough, Sometimes that's very convenient. This isn't the only way to encode integers as strings of bits. There are other ways that you could do it, but this is a pretty standard way to do it. For other sorts of objects that might form the inputs or the outputs to the computational problems we're interested in, we can come up with other encoding schemes. For example, think about how you might encode a vector or a graph as a binary string, or Think about how you might encode two binary strings into a single binary string, using just the symbols 0 and 1, without a space or any other symbol to separate the two strings. There are certainly ways to do these things, and in fact, we have a lot of freedom as to exactly how we do it. Often there won't be a single standard or universally agreed upon way to encode whatever thing we're talking about as a binary string, but that's okay, we can just pick one, or we can invent a new one if we prefer. From a purely formal viewpoint, we're thinking about computations as essentially mechanical transformations on strings of bits, and the specifics of whatever encoding schemes we use are certainly important at some level. But nevertheless, when we're designing and analyzing algorithms, we usually don't worry all that much about the specifics of the encoding schemes. If you ask two different people to come up with a way to encode, say, molecules of a certain type as binary strings, you might expect them to come up with different ways to do it. But if these were reasonable people who knew what they were doing, 
you could also reasonably expect that it would be a pretty simple computational process to translate back and forth between the two encoding schemes, most likely requiring a very straightforward computation that would be quite easy compared to the actual computation we're interested in. The bottom line is that the details concerning the encoding schemes we use are often quite secondary, and our focus is on the algorithms themselves. None of this is going to be an issue for this lesson, by the way. We're mainly going to be focusing on problems that concern integers, which we'll assume are encoded in binary. But it's something to be aware of. In general, for whatever sort of problem we're talking about, the input length refers to the number of bits we need to encode the input. And we view the input length as being the size of the instance of whatever problem we're thinking about. Now let's consider the computation itself, which is represented by the blue rectangle in this figure. The way that we'll measure the cost of this computation is to count the number of elementary operations that it requires. Intuitively speaking, an elementary operation is one involving a small, fixed number of bits or qubits that can be performed quickly and easily, like computing the AND of two bits, for instance. At a formal level, there are different ways to define what an elementary operation is, depending upon what computational model we're using. For example, an elementary operation could be one step of a Turing machine if we were using that model. For the purposes of this lesson, we're going to be focusing on circuit models, as I've already stated, and specifically quantum and Boolean circuits. When we're working with circuits, it's typical that we think about each gate as representing an elementary operation. We've seen several different quantum gates thus far in the series, including X, Y, and Z gates, Hadamard gates, S and T gates, controlled knot gates, swap gates, Toffoli gates, and Fredkin gates. We also talked about query gates in the context of the query model, but we're not going to be working within the query model in this lesson, so we won't worry about query gates for now. We also saw that any unitary operation on any number of qubits can be viewed as a gate if we want to do that. For the purposes of measuring cost, though, that's not going to be very helpful. So what we're going to do is we're simply going to pick a set of gates, and we'll view that set as being our set of elementary operations. First, we'll include the single qubit unitary gates that you see here, namely X, Y, and Z gates, Hadamard gates, and S and T gates, as well as their inverses, or conjugate transposes. We don't actually need all of these gates. As soon as we have Hadamard and T gates, we can implement the rest of them, but just for the sake of convenience, we're going to include all of them. We'll also include controlled NOT gates, and these will be the only multiple qubit gates in our set. And finally, we'll include single qubit standard basis measurements so that we can actually get some classical information coming out of our circuits. If we focus just on the unitary gates and forget about the measurements for a moment, we obtain what's called a universal gate set. What that means is that any unitary operation on any number of qubits can either be implemented exactly or arbitrarily closely with a quantum circuit built out of just these gates. In other words, this is a good enough set of gates that we can build any unitary operation out of them. Not necessarily exactly, but we can get as good an approximation as we want. That might require a lot of gates, and it's actually not too hard to reason that it must require a lot of gates sometimes, but nevertheless, it's always possible. It's not a simple matter to prove that this is a universal gate set, though, and we won't discuss how that's done in the series. But it is a pretty well-known fact, and there are, in fact, different ways that it can be proved. There are also other gate sets that are sometimes used instead of this one, such as Toffoli gates, Hadamard gates, and S gates, in addition to measurements. But this is a pretty standard choice. So, in summary, these are the quantum operations that we'll view as being elementary. For Boolean circuits, we're going to consider these four gates to be elementary operations, AND gates, OR gates, NOT gates, and FANOUT. FANOUT, by the way, is not always counted as being a gate, but it's going to be important for us to do this, as we will see later in the lesson. Similar to what we had for our standard quantum gate set, 
This set is a little bit redundant. You don't need both AND and OR. You can create either one using the other with three NOT gates. But it doesn't hurt to include both, and it's just convenient. As you may already know, this is a universal gate set for deterministic computations, meaning that any function from bits to bits can be implemented with a Boolean circuit composed of gates from this collection. Once again, just like we had for quantum circuits, this doesn't mean that every function can be implemented efficiently by a Boolean circuit. And indeed, most functions can only be implemented with very large circuits, for the simple reason that there are lots and lots of functions. And they can't all have small circuits. There just aren't enough small circuits to go around. Universality is easier to prove in this case than in the quantum case, as it turns out. So if you don't already know how to prove it, Give us some thought and see if you can figure it out, if you're so inclined. Now that we've decided on the gates we're going to allow and we're going to consider to be elementary operations, we can think about how many of them are required to perform various computations. To do that, we'll make use of this definition for the size of a circuit. This definition works for both Boolean and quantum circuits, and it's very simple. The size of a circuit is the total number of gates it has. For example, if we return to the same example we've seen several times, which is our Boolean circuit for computing the exclusive OR of two bits, we see that it has size 7, because there's 7 gates. Two fanout gates, two NOT gates, two AND gates, and one OR gate. If we decided not to count fanout gates, which is common, it would have size equal to 5, but we are going to count fanout gates, so its size is 7. The size of a circuit corresponds to the number of elementary operations we need to perform. So, if we were to perform those operations sequentially, then the size would tell us how long it would take. So, you can think about a circuit's size as representing sequential running time. This is going to be how we measure computational cost for the purposes of this lesson. There is another property of circuits, though, that can also be viewed as the amount of time required to run a circuit, and that's the circuit's depth. To be precise, the depth is the maximum number of gates encountered on any path from an input wire to an output wire, which is equivalent to the number of layers of gates we need to create the circuit, where a layer refers to a bunch of gates that could be performed simultaneously because they don't have any wires in common. For example, our circuit from before has depth 4, and we can see directly from the diagram that there are four layers. The fanout gates can be performed simultaneously, the NOT gates can be performed simultaneously, and the AND gates can be performed simultaneously as well. So, we can think about circuit depth as representing parallel running time. Circuit depth is certainly an interesting and important notion, and there are some very sophisticated techniques that can be used to reduce the depth required for some computations, sometimes quite dramatically, in fact. But it's an advanced topic, and we're not going to have too much more to say about it in this series. So, once again, we'll measure computational cost in terms of circuit size, or in other words, the number of elementary operations required to perform a computation. At the beginning of the lesson, we talked about the integer factorization problem, and we saw that the time required for an algorithm to solve this problem can increase as inputs grow in length. And this is typically the issue we focus on when we're analyzing algorithms. That is, we're interested in how the costs of running algorithms scale as inputs get larger and larger. Of course, this sort of scaling isn't the only thing that matters. For example, we may simply be interested in finding the factors of RSA 1024 and that's it. So in a case like that, we'd be talking about a single problem instance where nothing is growing. But when we're thinking about algorithms, the way that their costs scale matters a great deal, and it tells us a lot about the algorithms. This point of view is consistent with the idea that algorithms are fundamental. And as I talked about before, as time goes on and technology advances, they will be deployed against larger and larger inputs. But notice that while inputs to computational problems can grow in size, circuits don't grow. Each circuit has a fixed size. 
And for that reason, if we want to describe an algorithm using circuits, we're actually going to need a family of circuits to do that. And by a family of circuits, we mean a collection of circuits that gets larger and larger, so that we can accommodate inputs as they get larger and larger. For example, let's consider a classical deterministic algorithm for the integer factorization problem. Maybe one based on trial division, but the specifics don't really matter for the sake of this example. We could, in principle, describe such an algorithm using a family of Boolean circuits, where if we want to factor a number whose binary representation has n bits, we grab the circuit Cn from our family, and we input the number that we want to factor into the input bits of that circuit. Sometimes we might choose to parameterize these circuits in different ways, so it might not always be the case that the nth circuit has n input bits, but that's a pretty typical way to do it. Naturally, as the input lengths get longer, we would expect the circuits in this family to get larger, reflecting the fact that factoring 4-bit numbers is a lot easier than factoring 1024-bit numbers, for instance. And so, with that in mind, we measure the cost of such an algorithm by a function, which tells us how many elementary operations we need for each possible input length. And we can do this for both classical and quantum algorithms. As an example, let's consider the problem of integer addition, which is certainly much simpler than factoring, or even computing GCDs. Just to keep things simple, let's suppose that both n and m are non-negative integers, and that they're represented by binary strings having the same length. How might we build Boolean circuits that add these two numbers together? Well, let's start with an algorithm, the standard algorithm for addition which is the base2 analog of the method that I presume we all learned for adding numbers together with a pencil and a piece of paper. So, we start with the least significant bits, add them together, and that gives us the least significant bit of the result, along with a carry bit that we have to consider when we move to the next position. And we continue moving through the bits, generating output bits, along with carry bits, until we get to the end. This method can be expressed pretty directly in terms of Boolean circuits. One way to think about it is to start off with a small circuit for adding two single-bit integers together. That'll give us a number between 0 and 2, where the lesser significant bit is the XOR of the input bits, and the more significant bit, or the carry bit if you prefer, is the AND of the two input bits. Sometimes we refer to a circuit that performs these two operations together as a half adder. That works fine when there are just two input bits, but if we want to add together integers with more than just one bit each, we're going to need to deal with the carry bits somehow. So what we can do is to cascade two half adders together and take the OR of the carry bits they produce to create what's called a full adder, which is basically a Boolean circuit for adding three single bit numbers together. And once we have a full adder, we can add numbers together simply by cascading, proceeding from the least significant bit to the most significant bit. We're basically just implementing the standard addition algorithm using the full adders to deal with the carry bits. So what's the cost of this computation? Well, we need 7 elementary gates for each XOR gate, which means 10 gates for a half adder, and therefore 21 gates for a full adder, which is 2 half adders plus an OR gate. So, at the end of the day, if our input numbers both have n bits, we need a half adder for the least significant bit, and a full adder for every other bit, and the end result is 21 times n minus 1 plus 10, or 21n minus 11 gates in total. If we decided for some reason that we didn't want to count the fan-out gates, and we included the XOR gates in our gate set, we'd need 5n minus 3 gates in total. It's nice to know exactly how many gates, or elementary operations, are required to perform different computations, such as we just saw with integer addition. And of course, if we actually want to implement these computations, we need to know these details. But if we always go into this much detail, especially for more complicated algorithms, we'll be very quickly buried in details that, in many cases, have secondary importance. One way to simplify matters that's very common in the analysis of algorithms is to make use of big O notation, which allows us to express and compare rates of growth in a pretty simple way that's very convenient. 
And here you can see the definition that underlies this notation. Suppose that we have two functions, g and h, which we can think of as taking non-negative integer values for simplicity, although that's not actually required. Maybe g and h represent costs of different computations, for instance. We then say that g is big O of h, which is traditionally written with an equal sign like this, if g of n is at most some positive constant c times h of n, so long as n is large enough. So this is about what happens when n gets large. Formally, what large enough means is that there's some choice of n0, so that the inequality is true whenever n is at least n0. The key here is that these numbers c and n0 are fixed. They can be any numbers at all, but whatever they are, they can't change as n grows. If you've never seen this kind of definition before, it might take some getting used to, and you can find resources that will explain this concept in a lot more detail than I'm able to in this lesson. Usually what we do is to choose the function h to be simple, in order to express something about how quickly the function g grows. For example, the function whose value is 17 times n cubed minus 257 times n squared plus 65,537 is big O of n cubed. And you can fit this example to the definition by picking c and n0 appropriately. For example, if we take c to be 18, then we'll have that the expression is indeed a most 18 times n cubed as long as n is big enough. Tying this notation back to the example of integer addition, what we can now say is that there exists a family of Boolean circuits for adding non-negative integers together, such that the size of the nth circuit, meaning the one that works for inputs of length n, is big O of n. The actual size of Cn, according to our analysis, was 21 times n minus 11, but that's big O of n. Now, it's not always a smart thing to do to throw away details like this. But here it makes sense because it reveals the essential nature of the standard addition algorithm, which is that its cost scales linearly in the size of the numbers that we're adding together. And this expression is not sensitive to some of the low-level details of our model, such as precisely which gates we consider to be elementary operations. For instance, if we decided that XOR gates should be considered as elementary operations, or that fanout gates shouldn't count as gates, or both, we'd still have that integer addition can be computed at cost big O of n. Here's another example of a computational problem, multiplication of integers. Similar to addition, we can ask what the cost of this computation is. If we consider the standard multiplication algorithm, meaning the base two analog of the method for multiplying numbers taught in elementary schools, which is basically just shifting and adding when we're working with numbers in binary, we find that there are Boolean circuits having size big O of n squared for multiplying n-bit integers. I won't go through this one in detail. Of course, the circuits are a little bit more complicated than the ones for addition, but if you think about the way that the standard multiplication algorithm works, it shouldn't come as a surprise. In essence, we need to do roughly n additions, each of which has linear cost, and so we end up with quadratic cost overall. This can be generalized. If one of the numbers has n bits and the other one has m bits, then we need circuits of size big O of n times m. Here, by the way, we are actually using an extension of the big O notation where we have multiple variables, but it can be extended like this. And if you're interested in the specific details, I'll refer you to the textbook content for the lesson, which again is linked in the video description. It's actually possible to multiply together two n-bit integers in a way that's asymptotically superior to the standard multiplication algorithm. In particular, the Schoenhage-Strassen multiplication algorithm multiplies two n-bit integers with a cost of big O of n times the length of n times the length of the length of n. So, as n gets large, like tens of thousands of bits, this is actually a more efficient way to multiply but it's complicated, and the overhead does make it impractical for smaller numbers. So let's add multiplication to our list of examples, and just for simplicity, let's list the cost given by the standard multiplication algorithm, which is big O of n squared. 
So once again, we're focusing on the essential nature of this cost, which is that it scales quadratically or subquadratically if we use asymptotically superior methods. We can also consider the problem of integer division, which is stated precisely on the screen. Here, we're talking about computing a quotient and a remainder. So the answer consists of two integers, q and r. Once again, there's a standard algorithm for division, and it also has quadratic cost. And like multiplication, there are in fact asymptotically superior algorithms. So how do GCD algorithms compare? Well, Euclid's algorithm turns out to have quadratic cost. And that's what I meant earlier in the lesson when I said that we can compute GCDs at roughly the same cost as multiplying two numbers together. Once again, there are asymptotically superior algorithms along similar lines to addition and multiplication, although the cost is a little bit higher in this case, at least as far as we know. I'll mention just one more example of a problem to add to this list, and that's modular exponentiation. Here, there are three input numbers, k, m, and n. And the goal is to compute n to the power k modulo m, which means the remainder after we divide by m. It's not at all obvious, but we can compute modular exponentiation at cubic cost, meaning big O of n cubed for n bit integers. The way to do this one is not to first compute n to the power k and then compute the remainder, even writing down n to the power k could require exponentially many bits, so that approach won't work. Instead, we can use an algorithm called the power algorithm, which is also called repeated squaring, where everything is done modulo m, and we use the bits of k to iteratively square and multiply in a way that makes it all work. So, this one is more expensive than the others, but we can still perform modular exponentiation quite quickly on numbers with many thousands of bits. So how do the costs of these tasks compare with integer factorization? If we start simple and think about trial division, where we first check to see if 2 is a factor of the input number, and then check 3, and so on, we'll end up with a pretty expensive algorithm. Big O of n squared times 2 to the power n over 2. Each division takes quadratic time, and in the worst case, we'll need to search for prime factors up to the square root of the input number, and that's where the n over 2 is coming from. If we haven't found a prime factor at that point, we can just stop because then the input number itself must be prime. This is extremely expensive because n appears as an exponent in this expression, which is to say that this algorithm has exponential cost. In contrast, all of the examples that we have in this box here have what we call polynomial cost, where n gets raised to a power, but that power is always a fixed number that doesn't grow as the input length grows. In these cases, the powers are 1, 2, and 3. I'll come back to polynomial versus exponential cost in just a moment, but first let's finish off what we know about factoring. Earlier I mentioned the number field sieve, which is the best factoring algorithm we have in terms of the way its cost scales. In fact, the cost of this algorithm isn't actually rigorously proven because it's connected with some open questions about number theory, but it is conjectured to have a cost that looks like this. This time the big O is in the exponent, but I'm going to sweep that detail under the rug. The key takeaway is that it's significantly better than trial division because Although n does appear in the exponent, it's raised to the power one third. And that translates to a much lower cost. And that's why this algorithm can handle numbers like RSA 250, whereas trial division most certainly can't. It's still exponential though, in the sense that a power of n is appearing in an exponent. And so, as a result, it still can't handle numbers like RSA 1024. Now let me say a little bit more about polynomial cost versus exponential cost. We say that an algorithm has polynomial cost if its cost is big O of n to the power b, where b can be any positive number, but the key is that b has to be fixed, meaning that it doesn't change as the input length n grows. For the examples we saw a moment ago, meaning integer addition, multiplication, division, 
computing GCDs and modular exponentiation, we had that B was either 1, 2, or 3. So these are all polynomial cost algorithms. But when we say polynomial cost more generally, B could be any positive number. It could even be 1 million, but it has to be fixed. As a very rough abstraction, algorithms having polynomial cost are typically viewed as representing efficient algorithms. It's definitely an oversimplification, but as a rough guideline, you can think about a polynomial cost algorithm as somehow making use of a problem's structure to construct a solution, as opposed to a brute force type of approach or an exhaustive search over a very large space. Of course, an algorithm whose cost scales as n to the 1 million on inputs of length n would not reasonably be viewed as efficient, and we wouldn't expect to be able to run it on large inputs. But still, even an n to the 1 million algorithm must be doing something clever that somehow reflects the structure of whatever problem it solves to avoid the exponential scaling and cost that would be associated with an exhaustive search over a large domain. And in practice, the identification of a polynomial cost algorithm is really just a first step towards efficiency. If a problem is important, and someone discovers the very first polynomial cost algorithm for it, maybe having a very large exponent, you can be reasonably sure that algorithm designers will find improvements that cause that exponent to come down. In essence, you can think about the existence of a polynomial cost algorithm for a problem as demonstrating the feasibility of solving that problem on reasonably large inputs. But there still could be a lot of work required to reach true efficiency. In complexity theory, it's typical to say that an algorithm's cost scales sub-exponentially if the cost is big O of 2 to the power n to the power epsilon for every positive real number epsilon. And if it's not sub-exponential, then it's exponential. Or it could even be super-exponential, like 2 to the 2 to the n, which is doubly exponential. But as long as the output isn't super-exponentially long, Every problem can actually be computed by a Boolean circuit having exponential cost, as it turns out. So the important distinction here is between polynomial and exponential cost. We don't know of any sub-exponential cost classical algorithms for integer factorization. For example, the number field sieve's cost is not big O of 2 to the n to the epsilon when epsilon is one-third or less, so it doesn't satisfy this definition. It's undoubtedly a very clever algorithm, but it's still a sieve, and we're still effectively searching over a very large space to identify factors of a given number. As we'll see in the next lesson, there is in fact a polynomial cost quantum algorithm for integer factorization. Shor's algorithm has polynomial cost, and specifically it has cubic cost, similar to modular exponentiation. Another class of problems that you might be familiar with is the class of NP-complete problems. I won't go into what NP-complete problems are in this lesson, but you can look them up if you're interested. It's conjectured that none of these problems have sub-exponential cost. That's essentially a circuit-based version of what's sometimes called the exponential time hypothesis, but so far nobody's been able to figure out how to prove it. In fact, we can't even prove that there aren't linear cost algorithms for NP-complete problems. It's just really tough, at least as far as we know, to rule out the possibility of a future discovery of an incredibly creative algorithm for these problems. Here's a figure that illustrates the relationship between polynomial and exponential cost. On the x-axis, we have the input length to whatever problem we're thinking about, and the y-axis represents the cost of solving that problem, or you can think about it as the time required to solve the problem if you prefer. An exponential cost algorithm might scale like this. For short inputs, the cost might not be particularly high, like factoring the number 12, for instance. But as the input length gets longer, the cost is eventually going to blow up. A polynomial cost algorithm, on the other hand, might have a scaling that looks like this. The cost will still increase in general as inputs get longer, and it might even cost more than the exponential cost algorithm for some inputs, 
but eventually it's going to be a lot less expensive than the exponential cost algorithm. And it doesn't blow up in the same extreme way that exponential cost algorithms do. So if we imagine that we have some maximum cost that we're willing to spend, or a maximum amount of time that we're willing to wait for an answer, if you prefer to think about time, then the exponential cost algorithm will only work for inputs up to a given length, whereas in general, the polynomial cost algorithm will allow us to solve the problem for larger inputs. And that's why, for instance, we can easily compute GCDs for numbers with many thousands of bits, but in the worst case, we can't factor numbers of this size. In the last part of the lesson, we'll turn our attention to implementing classical computations on quantum computers. More specifically, we'll see that any computation that can be performed by a Boolean circuit can also be performed by a quantum circuit at roughly the same cost. Moreover, this can be done in a clean manner that's important if we want to run these computations as subroutines inside of larger quantum computations, and I'll explain what I mean by clean when we get further into the discussion. We're going to make use of Toffoli gates in this process. Recall that Toffoli gates are controlled, controlled knock gates. So their action on standard basis states is as you see here on the screen. Notice that we can also think about Toffoli gates as being like query gates for the AND function. That's not to say that they are query gates in a literal sense. As I mentioned at the start of the lesson, we're not working within the query model at this point, but rather their action follows the same pattern as a query gate. We can think of the binary values A and B as the inputs to the AND function. And like a query gate, these values get echoed as part of the output. And the value of the function, meaning the logical AND of A and B, gets XORed onto the bottom qubit. Now, we haven't included Toffoli gates in our standard gate set. We could change our mind if we wanted to, but we don't really need to do that, because alternatively, we can implement Toffoli gates using Hadamard gates, T and T dagger gates, and controlled knot gates like you see right here. It's not at all obvious that this particular circuit implements a Toffoli gate, but it does. And you can either take my word for it, or multiply everything out for yourself to get some extra practice, or you can just ask Qiskit, or Python, or any software that multiplies matrices to do the multiplication for you. And you can check out the textbook content for the lesson to see this done using Qiskit. Now we can move on to simulating Boolean gates with quantum circuits. And all we'll need to do this are NOT gates, controlled NOT gates, and Toffoli gates. These operations are all deterministic in addition to being unitary, and sometimes we describe operations like this as being reversible. And in fact, the study of reversible computation predates quantum computing, and that's where this entire procedure actually comes from. The Boolean gates we need to worry about are NOT gates, AND and OR gates, and FANOUT gates. And what we're going to show is that we can implement these gates, or simulate them if you prefer, using NOT gates, controlled NOT gates, and Toffoli gates. To be clear, what we want are quantum circuits that allow us to compute the values of the Boolean gates that I just mentioned when we give them qubits in standard basis states as input. For arbitrary quantum state inputs, the action will be determined by linearity as usual. We don't need to do anything special with the NOT gates. NOT gates are NOT gates, and they can be implemented directly. AND and OR gates can be simulated using Toffoli and NOT gates. AND gates are easy, particularly in light of what I just said a few moments ago about Toffoli gates being essentially query gate implementations of the AND function. To be precise, what we can do is to introduce a new qubit, initialized to the zero state, and let that qubit be the target of our Toffoli gate, and let the two input qubits be the controls. Different names are given to extra qubits like this, which are often introduced into quantum computations. And I'll call them workspace qubits, just to pick a name. Our typical assumption on workspace qubits is that they start out in the zero state. And we can often return them to the zero state when we're done with them, but not always. In the diagram, we have a ket zero inside of the dotted rectangle, 
to indicate that the initialization of this qubit is part of the process. And if you don't have a fresh qubit like this, you're not going to be able to do this simulation. The bottom output qubit is the one we care about because that's the result of the AND operation. And we're basically done with the other two so they can stay inside of the box. In fact, you could even imagine that getting rid of these two qubits is part of the job of simulating this AND gate, kind of like garbage that needs to be cleaned up. But anyway, that's how we can simulate an AND gate. Now that we know how to do AND gates, we can do OR gates using one of the De Morgan laws. If you put NOT gates on the two inputs and the output of an AND gate, you'll get an OR gate, so it's as simple as that. And the last one is fanout. And for this one, all we need is a controlled NOT gate, along with a workspace qubit. Specifically, if we set the workspace qubit to be the target, we effectively just copy whatever standard basis state comes in. So that acts like a fanout gate. So we have all our gates. And now that we have all of our gates, we can move on to circuits. Let's suppose that we have some Boolean circuit named C. And this can be whatever Boolean circuit you choose, as long as it's composed of AND, OR, NOT, and fanout gates. We'll let T be the number of gates in C. And we'll give the name F to whatever function it is that C computes. So we can think of F as having the form that you see right here, where N is the number of input bits of C, M is the number of output bits, and sigma is the binary alphabet. And what we do is to simply go one by one through the gates of C. We leave the NOT gates alone, and we replace the others with the simulations that I just described. So if C looks like this, then what we get is a circuit R that looks like this. In this diagram, all of the workspace qubits we need for the simulations have been pulled out of their boxes and collected on the bottom. So k is the total number of workspace qubits we need, which is one for each of the gates of C except for the NOT gates. For the output of R, we have the qubits that correspond to the output of C, and here those qubits are depicted on the top, although it's not actually going to matter at the end of all of this whether they're on top or not. To be precise, Assuming that we run R on a standard basis state corresponding to an arbitrary n-bit string x, these m output qubits will be in the standard basis state corresponding to f of x. We also have all of the leftover qubits from the AND and the OR gates. We still need to account for them, and if we gather them all together, they'll be in some standard basis state. Whatever the standard basis state is has to be some function of the string x, and we're going to give that function the name g. So g is a new function that's determined by the gates of c that tells us what state these leftover qubits are in after r is run. g is the next letter after f, so that's one reason to call this function g, but another reason to call it g is because g is short for garbage. These are all garbage qubits. And in particular, we have two garbage qubits for each AND gate and for each OR gate. The total number of gates we need is big O of t. That's because for each gate of C, we need a bounded number of quantum gates. The OR gate is the most expensive one. For that one, we need three NOT gates along with one Toffoli gate. And a Toffoli gate costs us 15 gates from our standard gate set. So that's at most 18 gates in R for each gate of C. If you wanted to optimize this, you could. But for the purposes of a rough asymptotic analysis, we can simply say that R has big O of T gates. So, we've managed to compute the same function f that the original Boolean circuit C computed. And we've done this at a cost that's linear in the size of C. If all we care about is computing this function f, then we're done. But unfortunately, we do have these garbage qubits. And these garbage qubits are generally going to ruin the interference patterns that make quantum algorithms work if we try to use this circuit R as a subroutine inside of a larger quantum algorithm. But we can, in fact, get rid of this garbage. And the way that we can do this is to make use of the fact that the circuit R can be inverted. Or, in other words, we can run it in reverse. To illustrate how this works, let's imagine that we first run R, and then we run R in reverse, which we can express as R dagger. To be clear about this, what it means is that we apply the gates of R in the reverse order. 
and we take the inverses of each of the gates. Not gates, controlled not gates, and toffle gates are actually their own inverses. So if we're thinking in terms of these gates, then R dagger is really just R with the gates applied in the reverse order. But in general, we can always run any unitary quantum circuit in reverse in the manner that I just described, meaning that we apply the gates in the reverse order and we replace each of the individual gates by its inverse. If we were to do this, we'd find that first running R and then running R in reverse does nothing at all. So if we started out in a standard basis state like we have here, then we would end in exactly the same standard basis state. Of course, doing just that isn't very helpful, but what we can do is we can introduce a bunch of extra qubits. And specifically, this is m qubits, where m is the number of output bits of the circuit C. These additional qubits could be in any quantum state, but to explain how this works, we're going to assume that they're in a standard basis state corresponding to some string y. So y is an m bit string. And what we can do is to perform a bunch of controlled not gates, like you see right here, which effectively XORs the string f of x onto the string y stored in these bottom m qubits. And so the output of the entire computation is as it appears on the screen. X and Y are arbitrary binary strings. X has n bits and Y has m bits. And we also need k workspace qubits. When we run R, we compute f of x. And that string is stored in the top m qubits. But we also have a bunch of garbage qubits. So we XOR the output f of x onto the bottom m qubits and then run R in reverse to clean up the garbage. I should point out that it's important that R is deterministic. If these top m qubits could be instead in some superposition of standard basis states, this wouldn't work correctly, but this does work when R is deterministic. So if we compare the quantum circuit we just built to the original Boolean circuit C, we see that it basically works in the same way that a query gate works for an arbitrary function. There is a difference here, which is that we need these workspace qubits to make it all work, but otherwise, we've effectively built a query gate or a query circuit for whatever function it is that C computes. We also managed, by the way, to return the workspace qubits to their initial state. So they could, in principle, be reused as workspace qubits for subsequent computations. If we want to, we can put a box around the entire quantum circuit and call it Q, and the relationship to C becomes more clear. The circuit Q will be bigger than C in general. We need a handful of quantum gates in Q for each gate of C. And we also need the controlled not gates in the middle. But the number is still linear in the size of C. It should also be noted that this is a completely general procedure, which works for any Boolean circuit. And we haven't tried at all to optimize Q. For a specific circuit C, there might very well be ways to reduce the size of Q. And that includes using methods that reduce the number of workspace qubits needed, in case that's something that we want to do. And that is the procedure for running classical computations on a quantum computer. It's pretty simple, but it's an important thing to be able to do. In particular, now that we know how to do this, we're free to make use of any classical computations we want inside of quantum computations provided that we follow this form where the input gets echoed and the output gets XORed onto a bunch of qubits, just like we had for query gates. The cost scales linearly. So for example, we can create quantum circuits for problems like integer addition, multiplication, division, computing GCDs, and modular exponentiation, and this can all be done at the same asymptotic cost as for Boolean circuits. We do need workspace qubits to do this, but at least they're available to be reused again when we're done with them. One final remark that's worth mentioning is that this method provides us with a method to implement query gates, which I alluded to in the previous lesson. That is, if we have a query algorithm that takes some function f as input, and we have a way to compute f with a Boolean circuit, then we can follow this procedure to build a query gate for that function and then run our query algorithm on it. Whether or not that's a useful thing to do depends on the query problem itself and what we're trying to accomplish. But in essence, 
This construction provides us with a way of connecting the query model to a more standard model of computation. This is, in some sense, how Schar's algorithm for integer factorization works. We're going to build quantum circuits like this out of some of the arithmetic operations we talked about earlier in the lesson. And by doing that, we give quantum circuits the ability to evaluate those operations on superpositions of classical states. And as we will see, that allows us to factor integers efficiently. That's the end of this lesson, which has focused mainly on establishing a foundation for quantum algorithms in a standard, non-black box computational framework. We talked about computational cost, mainly through the lens of problems connected with basic number theory. We discussed polynomial versus exponential cost for computational tasks. And we saw how classical computations can be implemented by quantum circuits in a clean, garbage-free manner that allows them to be used as subroutines inside of larger quantum computations. I hope you'll join me for the next lesson, where we'll see how Shor's algorithm puts these ideas to use, allowing us to factorize integers at polynomial cost. Goodbye until then.